So far we've talked about distance in a very loose way, so let me clarify some ideas. So distance is a measure, and a measure of dissimilarity, so how different different points are in a data set. So remember that cluster analysis is described in terms of external separation and internal homogeneity. So there are many ways to do that, but we're going to define distance as any mathematical function that satisfies these two properties. One property is symmetry, meaning that the distance from i to j is the same as the distance from j to i, and positivity, that means that all the distances are positive. And the only possibility to have zero distance is that xi and xj are the same location. In this video I want to show you some possibilities, but first of all we have to standardize information. Remember that if you have these two data sets and you can see here that the range of one variable goes from 0 to 1 and the other variable from 0 to 6 or the other way around. So in this case the x1 goes from 0 to 6 and the other one from 0 to 1. So in one case we're clustering horizontally and in the other case we're clustering vertically. In order to avoid that we have to standardize information. Remember that we have to divide by the standard deviation after we have subtracted the mean value of all the data points. And this is especially relevant for different methods like the spectral clustering that instead of using k-means in which basically we are just drawing a line and this is not going to be much affected by this metric, we have the situation in which the distance is related to complex transformations of the data. Okay, so let's explore the most relevant ones for continuous variables. Here you have the Euclidean distance, which is the, the geometrical distance, and, but remember that x and y are not distances in, in a geometric sense, so this could be dimensions in a data set, this could be income, the years, whatever, okay? We also have the Manhattan distance, which is basically the same, but instead of taking the square root and squaring the, the difference, we are just taking the absolute value of the difference. We have the maximum distance, and this, this tends to be more conservative, because we are comparing things according to the worst case scenario. And we have a generalization of all of them, which is called the Q distance or Minkowski distance. And actually, you can, as a mathematical exercise, you can prove that k equals 2 corresponds to Euclidean, k equals 1 to Manhattan, and this is the hardest one. When k takes the limit to infinity, you are taking the maximum distance. Okay, let me talk to you about my favorite one, which is called the Manhattan distance. And as you remember that this is the sum of the absolute value of the differences. There are also some, some distances related to that, like the Canberra distance, which is a kind of weighted average of these parameters. But forget about the, forget about Canberra. What I, what I like about Manhattan is this more robust to outliers. And let me show you why. When you're trying to, to find the centroid, you want to identify which observation i is going to minimize this expression. So you're comparing this for all the members of the cluster and try to find that minimum. And if you remember for basic calculus, the minimum means that you're taking the derivative of the expression and try to go to zero. The problem is that you have a sum here. So outliers are basically contributing most to, to this sum. So they are somehow distorting this, this idea. So maybe you could have an observation i which is minimizing this, but because it's closer to the outlier. That doesn't happen with Manhattan. Basically, when you try to minimize that function, the absolute value, this is going to be a straight line. So this is going to be just the sign of the difference. And, and essentially, what you're trying to minimize when you're choosing the centroid is which one minimizes this expression. So the only thing that matters is how many points you have on the right or on the left. And this is why this is called the taxi cap distance, because when you're comparing these two points, the only thing that matters is if this point is in this side of the, of the city or in this side of the city. So the green line is going to be different, but the blue lines are the blue, the red, and the yellow are going to provide the same Manhattan distance. And this is one important point. But the other important point is that Manhattan is computationally more efficient than Euclidean. Why is that? Because for a computer, calculating the square and then the square root is less efficient than just taking the absolute value. Okay, what if we have binary variables? In, in this case, the similarity variables are, are used comparing how many variables do you have the same value for both objects, so you're comparing i and j. And in that case, you can define this distance, which is basically the, is a kind of accuracy, so you have the diagonal of this matrix, and then you divide it by some weighted average of, of the, 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 the values on the diagonal and the values outside the diagonal. So the, the first case is when you take the weight equals 1, this is actually the same as the accuracy that we've seen before. But you can also tweak a little bit that expression, so larger values of w are going to give you more relevance to reducing the differences, and larger, lower values of w, like for instance 0.5, are going to give more relevance to being equal. So in summary, if you don't want to think much about it, the Euclidean distance is the default one, and it's going to work pretty much well. The Manhattan is better in, in, much, in, in many senses, it's faster and it's slightly more robust to outliers. If you want to be conservative in the definition of clusters, you have to use a maximum distance. 
And for binary data, you have this expression that looks like the accuracy, but has nothing to do, because basically we're comparing different observations which are categorical. Okay, what about similarity? Because distance is a method of dissimilarity. So this is not so used, but it has some interesting applications. Mathematically, similarity functions are defined fulfilling a couple of properties. One property is symmetry, and the other is positivity. And actually, they are typically normalized between 0 and 1. The most popular one is called cosine similarity, and the idea is that you take the dot product of two vectors, and then you divide by the norm. So this is a kind of mathematical way of describing the, the cosine of these two observations. You can also define a distance, so similarity would be something like 1 minus angular distance, and angular distance would be something like the arc cosine or the inverse cosine of, of this function. Okay, so let me show you first why this is not very useful in general terms, and then I will show you some cases in which it is. So in principle, the idea is that, well, defining the angle, you can distinguish between points in a cluster which has low angles, as you can see here, so the, the blues are low angles, the oranges are low angles, but if you compare observations in different, in, in different clusters, the angle is going to be large. So in that sense, this should work. But the problem is that if you start measuring from this point, then you can see that this point has a given angle, and the angle is going to be the same to that observation. So when you're comparing different observations, these two points would be actually at the same distance. So this is not a very good metric. But this is very useful in information retrieval and text mining. Why is that? Because that what matters is the relative angle and, and not the absolute angle. So let me show you an example. So imagine that we want to compare a couple of documents and imagine one document has something like this, machine learning can be hard, and the other document says machine learning can be simple. So these are pretty similar actually. So there is just one word of difference between the two of them. Okay? So let's define different dimensions. So one dimension would be the number of appearances of each word in each document. So document one would have something like this vector, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then a 0. Other documents would be all 1s and 0 would be at heart. Okay, so now let's define the dot product. So the dot product, remember, which is multiplying dimension by dimension and then sum. So this is going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 and so on and so forth. So the product is going to be 4. And now we take the, 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 the absolute value, which is the square root of each observation square. So 1 square plus 1 square plus 1 square and so on and so forth. So the, the, mod, the, the absolute value of this is going to be 2.24. And this vector has the same, the same length in this dimensional space. Okay, so now we can compute the cosine. It's going to be 4 divided by 2.24 times 2.24. So in summary, the similarity would be something like 0.80 or something like 80%, okay, which is not bad as a simple metric. Another absolutely astonishing application of this is the Open Post project. So the project has one particular aim, which is try to create these sort of cartoons of the position of the body. You can see that this is a kind of cartoon version of, the, of these humans, and this is automatically extracted from the video. And where does cosine similarity enters in display? Because you can compare different positions using this metric. So imagine that you want to measure how, how is the coordination between all these dancers in this video. Then you can compare the angles and you can take a look at the position. And you can compare actually the relative position of different sticks in this humanoid version of, of the body.